Tonight, extreme weather gripping all corners of this country. A deadly flood disaster in the Northeast. Roads crumbling under the weight of rushing floodwaters. Crews still searching for two young children in Pennsylvania after their family was swept away and now even more rain moving in. Out west, the deadly heat dome spreading. Phoenix topping 110 degrees for an 18th straight day. Hospitals pushed to their limits with heat sick patients and that dangerous smog from the Canadian wildfires making a comeback. The major cities on alert this week. Serial killer clues. Police ramping up their investigation after the stunning arrest of a New York man accused of killing at least three women on Long Island. The weapons authorities found as they combed through his home and a storage locker. Plus, what authorities are saying about the possibility this suspect could be charged in even more unsolved murders. To catch a fugitive, the stunning moments police in Pennsylvania arrested an inmate who had been on the run for nine days. Tonight, you'll hear from the couple who helped nab that suspect. The chilling moment they confronted the accused murderer after their dog noticed an intruder on their property. A developing story out of Chicago, a plane's emergency slide falling from the sky and into a neighborhood. Investigators now on the scene. Plus, the Kennedy family feud, members of the political dynasty coming out to denounce Robert Kennedy Jr. over his claims the COVID pandemic was, quote, ethnically targeted, what it means for his bid for the White House. And landslide horror, video capturing the moment of mountainside, came crumbling down, trapping multiple people inside a tunnel in South Korea. The urgent effort to get them out. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Tonight we begin another week right here on Top Story with the summer of extreme weather. It's showing no signs of letting up. Flash floods, deadly heat, and that wildfire smoke wreaking havoc for millions of Americans. Take a look at the power of the torrential rains that have battered New England. This road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire, buckling under the force of that rushing water. The highway just folding in on itself. Pennsylvania. Bearing the brunt of those severe storms, the eastern half of the state inundated with deadly flash floods, at least five people killed. And two young children swept away in the raging water on Sunday, rescue teams tripling their efforts tonight, searching up and down the Delaware River. And that Canadian wildfire smoke back yet again. This is the view from Wrigley Field of a hazy Chicago skyline. Look at that. Air quality alerts in effect from Montana to right here in New York. You see it all across the map. And if you're not one of the millions under alert for that smog, you are likely under a heat alert at this hour. Temperatures across the southwest still dangerously high. Meteorologist Bill Cairns is tracking it all for us tonight. But we want to begin first with those devastating floods and NBC's Kathy Park, who leads us off from Pennsylvania. Tonight, the search intensifying in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, for two-year-old Maddie Shields and her nine-month-old brother, Conrad. The siblings visiting from South Carolina were torn from their family and swept away in these fierce floodwaters Saturday. We ask that you continue to pray for the return of Conrad and Matty and for the safety of all those committed to bringing them home to us. Crews tripling their resources today, looking for any sign of the children. We had air assets in the air as well as drones. We also had uh, uh, cadaver dogs, search and rescue dogs. Officials say their grandmother was found alive, but their mother, 32-year-old Katie Seely, is now among the five killed in the flash floods. These people did not drive into high water. They were caught. This was a flash flood. The relentless rain rose so quickly, cars were pulled with the rushing waters, trapping drivers. Saw cars floating, saw a Jeep flipped over. It was like nothing I've ever seen. Some spots picking up nearly three inches of rain in one hour. This resident capturing the chaos outside her house. It was a river that went past here. It was probably three feet above. There is no way anybody would survive this. The punishing storms also battered other parts of the Northeast, still recovering from catastrophic floods last week. Back in Bucks County, even neighbors joining the efforts to find the missing. These little kids are somewhere. They're either in the canal path or in the Delaware River. Or, mm -hmm. But the community, that's what they're focused on. They want to find these little kids. Kathy joins us tonight from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is in the eastern part of that state. Kathy, you know, what more do we know about how those children were swept away? 
Well, Tom, officials say that when their family car got stuck in the floodwaters, their grandmother and their mother tried to save those young kids. Incredibly, the grandmother survived. Unfortunately, the mom is among the dead. Just shows you how fast that water rushes in. And Kathy, how is the weather factoring into the search efforts right now? We heard there from one of the rescue teams at the end of your piece. So, Tom, fortunately, today there was no rain, so weather was certainly on the side of the rescue crews. Tomorrow it could be a much different story. Uh, heavy showers are in the forecast, so that could lead to some new challenges. And, Tom, keep in mind the ground already very saturated. Okay, Kathy Tom? Park with a very sad, sad story tonight. Kathy, we thank you for joining us. We're also following that deadly heat wave from coast to coast. Hospitals pushed to crisis levels by the unrelenting heat. One UPS driver telling us his truck is so hot inside he can cook a burger on his dashboard. And that's not a joke. Aaron McLaughlin is on the ground for us again tonight in a sweltering Phoenix, Arizona. Tonight, the deadly heat dome tightening its grip, fueling fires in California and making history in the Southwest. Phoenix, a day away from smashing a 47-year-old record. Tonight, marking 18 straight days with highs 110 plus, with scorching temps expected through the week. Straining the city's essential services, firefighters going from call to call. She was uh, hot to the touch. Tonight, more than 70 million people under heat alerts across 15 states. In San Diego, a mountain biker died trying to help heat-exhausted hikers. And in Utah, this harrowing rescue. First responders airlifting a hiker who collapsed under the scorching sun. Back in Phoenix, the city's largest hospitals reaching crisis levels treating heat-related illness. Our waiting room is filled with people with heat and heat-related illness. They just want to get in from the heat. Nationwide, more people dying from heat than any other extreme weather event, including hurricanes. A fact not lost on the nation's delivery drivers. Scott Stevens and Dan Garcia have been delivering packages for UPS. Shifts lasting 8 to 12 hours a day in 110 plus without air conditioning. If you're driving with the sun coming in, we have fans, but... You know, this time of year, the fans is like a blow dryer hitting you in the face. I don't even turn them on. How hot is it inside your truck? It's hot enough to uh, bake cookies and hamburgers. In June, UPS announced plans to ensure all newly purchased trucks come with air conditioning. Elsewhere, it's the air that's the problem, with 85 million Americans under air quality alerts in Chicago, New York City, and Cleveland, as parts of Canada continue to burn. It all amounts to a summer of suffering, with more on the way. And with that, Aaron McLaughlin joins us now from a hydration station in Phoenix where it's currently 116 degrees. So, Aaron, remind our viewers, because we have to kind of remind everyone, what are some of the signs of heat exhaustion? Yeah, Tom, according to the CDC, the signs of heat exhaustion are headache, nausea, and dizziness. The CDC also says that if you're working in this kind of extreme heat, you should be drinking at least 24 fluid ounces of water an hour, which is roughly the size of this bottle right here. And Aaron, before you go, you've been covering that part of the country for us for several days now in, in that wicked heat. What has that been like and what are you and your team sort of going through day in, day out? Tom, this is extraordinarily hot conditions. In fact, I would say that this is the hottest I've ever been in my lifetime. That being said, speaking to residents here who are used to this kind of temperature in the summer, it's the duration. It's the fact that this has been going on for 18 days and it looks really set to break a record at this point. That is what's making the difference here in terms of the number of people heading to the hospital. Tom. Okay, Aaron, get inside and get into that AC if you can. I want to bring in Bear, Bill Karens for more on what we can expect from this extreme weather in the days ahead. So, Bill, let's start with that heat. We've already seen so many heat records smashed in the past few weeks. Are we in for more of the same in the coming days? We are, but not to the level that we were on Sunday. Sunday, I'm going to consider the peak of this long duration heat wave, especially for areas of the southwest. But now the heat's going to head towards the middle of the country, especially through the southern half. Look at Dallas right now. Right now, 106 degrees in the shade. And tomorrow, we're going to expand that even more to the east. Little Rock is now under excessive heat warnings. We're still blistering hot in areas of the west, but we're pushing it towards the east. And a lot of people have been like, well, when are we going to get done with this? Well, this is the six to ten day outlook for all of next week. And you notice all of the west remains very hot in areas of Texas. The southeast may get a break, Tom, but that's going to be short-lived because it looks like the end of July, beginning of August, the heat builds to the east coast. Oh, wow. Okay, and then, Bill, it's not just the U.S. feeling the heat right now, right? We're seeing record temperatures all around the globe. 
Yeah, especially Southern Europe. This is what they're, what they're considering their second heat wave of the summer and the worst one yet. Italy, Southern Italy and Greece is probably the worst of it. Uh, Rome, 105 on Tuesday, Wednesday, 101. You notice in Athens, a pair of 100s, and it's kind of widespread. You, you kind of expect Spain to be very hot, but Madrid, 105 is not going to be comfortable either. And then, Bill, as we reported that smoke from the Canadian wildfires to kind of bring it back to the U.S., it's returned again. Walk us through what we should expect this week. Yeah, that unwanted guest, right? Every now and then it just pops up every two to three weeks. So now we're watching the heat advisories in the areas of the southwest. Now we're watching the alerts for the air quality in the northeast. That's why almost everyone's getting a piece of it this summer. So the Ohio Valley to the northeast was definitely the worst today. It was more smog down in the Atlanta. Smog is like what we you know used to have, like, but now they call it ozone. Smog is what we used to call it in the 80s and the 90s. But the smoke by tomorrow afternoon really kind of breaks up. The worst of it's now and tomorrow morning. But the air quality, if you're out there this evening is not pretty, especially anywhere in the orange and reds. When we get in the red, we're unhealthy for everyone, not just the sensitive groups. So Pittsburgh, Roanoke, towards Washington, D.C., and New York, and Syracuse are right on the edge, edge of that, too. Uh, should be better tomorrow at this time. Okay, we hope so. Bill, we thank you for all of that. We're also following breaking news tonight here on Top Story out of Chicago, where an emergency slide from a United Airlines slide fell from the sky into a residential neighborhood. Barely missing a home, this is it right here. The Boeing 767 aircraft landed safely at Chicago's O'Hare Airport after a flight from Switzerland. I want to get right to NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster, who joins us live from Chicago. So, Shaq, what do we know about what happened there with this slide? Well, Tom, we're actually learning more. I just learned more in the past couple of minutes from residents in that area. They say that slide that you're looking at on your screen right now, it actually fell on the roof of a home before landing in someone's backyard. One witness who was there in the moments afterwards described an engine smell. Uh, it's important to note that no one was injured um, in any of this. Uh, there were people in the home at the time, but no one was injured. There was largely cosmetic damage to the home. But the FAA says, says maintenance workers at O'Hare then discovered that the United flight was missing that emergency flight uh, slide. Uh, it's important to note that that flight, Tom, also landed safely. And then the FAA, like, what are they saying about this incident? It is so bizarre. Yeah, they say they are investigating. We know that their investigations can go on for some time, but they are confirming that they're investigating uh, at this point to see what caused this and to really get down to the bottom of it. Uh, I mentioned the flight landed safely. We also know that there were 165 passengers on board. That flight was coming in from Switzerland. Uh, it is definitely a bizarre scene. It's you looking at those pictures on your screen right now. This was a residential area, Tom. So it's a, a miracle almost that this did and land in a more dangerous place. Think a highway on the way to the airport. Yeah, time. I mean, but there could have been kids playing out there as well, Shaq. Lucky you no know, we got hurt. Okay, Absolutely. Shaquille Brewster for us. Thanks so much, buddy. Tonight, escape murder suspect Michael Burham is back in custody after escaping prison and spending more than a week on the run. More than 200 law enforcement officers in a desperate search, but it was a local couple and their dog that helped pin down the suspect. NBC's George Solis spoke with them. A nine-day search for escape murder suspect Michael Burham ended thanks to a barking dog named Tucker. We get in the golf cart to go see what he's barking at. And uh, so we go down the creek, and he's still barking. And the gentleman stands up, and I asked him, so what are you doing? He says, I'm camping. Ron and Cindy Eklund weren't buying it. Do you think he saw and noticed someone that doesn't belong on our property? I think he no noticed someone didn't belong because, he does. He like you guys can see, he likes to play. And he just kept barking, 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 like, this isn't right. And I seen a long tattoo he had, and I'm like, in his face, I said, no, get in the golf cart. Let's go. They called 911, and in minutes, police were everywhere. What is it when you come face to face with the person everybody is literally looking for? <laughs> oh, my. I was scared. Yeah. From the couple's home, authorities pushed Burnham through these woods. It's time on the run, coming to an end right here, arrested in front of this tree. For all his efforts to elude them, authorities say he made one crucial mistake. It's been our strategy all along is to push him hard, to have him make a mistake. He finally did. Burham's now at the Erie County Prison, where he's on suicide watch as a precaution. Put him in a suicide smock, uh, give them very little things. We have a psychiatrist in there right now speaking with him. Burham is only allowed a mattress with no bed sheets. Police say he's a known survivalist with a military background. His skills helped him and hampered authorities as they searched following his brazen escape from the Warren County Jail, dangling himself over the roof's edge next to these windows and down a rope made from bed sheets. 
He'd been in jail since May on kidnapping, burglary, and other related charges. As they hunted him, investigators found hidden stashes of supplies, clothes, and even ammunition. So that was one of the things that led us to be concerned that he may very well be armed. When police caught him, they say he didn't have a weapon. People in Warren are just glad the whole saga is over. Now my little brother's his graduation party yesterday, so we're all celebrating and somebody runs out and says he was caught. And everyone starts clapping, everyone's just excited. All right, George Solis joins us now live from outside that prison in Erie, Pennsylvania. George, you spoke with the couple there that found him, and I know they said they were scared. Did they think at any point he was going to basically follow them or, or harm them in any way? Yeah, Tom, it was certainly a consideration for them. They really just said they were being good pet parents and they wanted to go check on their dog. Of course, they encounter Michael Burham. They don't stick around to ask him anything further beyond that one question, and they immediately take off to call 911. And then, of course, you saw how the rest of it played out with law enforcement detaining him shortly thereafter, Tom. And then is the couple going to get a reward for helping with Burham's capture? They sure are. They're getting $2,000 tomorrow from the local Crime Stoppers, and a source with the U.S. Marshal Service tells NBC News they're likely to get the rest of that $20,000 that was out there for any information leading up to his arrest. Tom? Yeah, they definitely deserve it. All right, George Solis, great interview there. We appreciate it. We turn now to the Americas and the ongoing debate over immigration and border security. The issue is still top of mind for many voters. A recent NBC News poll found 80 percent of voters say Congress should address providing a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who meet certain criteria and pass background checks. But a Reuters poll in May, around the time of Title 42 expiring, found that 54 percent of Americans were against raising the number of immigrants allowed into this country each year. At the same time, many employers are facing a tight labor market and a challenge in hiring seasonal workers legally. Now, one border state congressman is set to introduce a bill to try and ease that burden. I want to bring in Republican Congressman Tony Gonzalez. He represents Texas's 23rd district, which makes up more than 800 miles of the U.S.-Mexico border. He's the author of Higher Act, of the Higher Act. So, Congressman, you're introducing this bill tomorrow. It aims to ease the labor shortages with a three-pronged approach. Explain how this would work. Uh, thank you for having me on tonight, Tom. You know, uh, immigration is a topic that most people like to use as a political football. I think now is an opportunity for us to solve this problem. And instead of having politicians bicker, we need to have statesmen that come together and mend this issue. Uh, my bill does three simple things. One, it extends work visas from one year to three years. The second part is it allows technology to cut through some of the red tape. We, know, we, we learned that in COVID, that there's a lot of programs that don't need to have so much red tape around them. And the third thing, it allows companies to highlight uh, to American workers that some of these jobs aren't seasonal jobs, that they're, they're more long term. I think it answers a few things. A big part of it, too, is there's an economic piece to it. There's no reason somebody should have to wait 30 minutes for a beer, right? There's a, there's a real shortage there for small businesses. The other part is the security aspect of it. We absolutely need to know who's coming to our country. Most people are here for economic purposes. So let's not send them down the, the asylum route knowing full well they're not going to qualify for asylum. If there's a work fee, a, that makes sense. And then the third piece is a humanitarian piece. A person shouldn't be smuggled in a train or a, a plane or, or in a, a, a backseat of a car. Imagine if they could come over legally work and have the ability to work. Now, this doesn't tackle some of the other issues of immigration, but I think it needs, it's, a, it's a much needed first step of bringing this country together. And, and Representative Gonzalez, why does the U.S. sort of hire, um, I, I would say, a smaller number of workers sort of for our size, because I think we have similar numbers to Canada and we're a much bigger country when it comes to the type of, of, of labor you're talking about. I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple, Tom. The, the work visa process is so convoluted and expensive that it's, it's only a select few can go down that route. If you're using work visas to fill in some of your gaps, you're in such a desperate situation that you're, you're willing to pay a, an extraordinary amount of money to do that. What this bill does is it basically lowers the price of that and allows small, small businesses like restaurants. Not only that, also health care. You know, you know if people are waiting to see a doctor or a nurse. You know, one part of my district in West Texas, we were basically saved because we had work visas from uh, nurses from the Philippines to help fill in some of that gap. The bill already has 10 Republicans and five uh, Democrats on it, 15 members of Congress, which is a small miracle in itself and has over 25 outside co-sponsors. So I'm very optimistic about getting some traction. Last month, you wrote an op-ed for the San Antonio Express. I want to put part of this up for our viewers to read. 
You wrote, politicians more concerned with boosting their own interest over what is best for our economic and national security are causing a rift in negotiating concrete, credible reforms to bolster the workforce and economy. That notion that issuing temporary work visas to individuals who want to come to our country legally to work will take away opportunities from Americans is fear-mongering. It's a false narrative. So I, I want to ask you about that, right? Because as a politician, you're taking on immigration. You're a Republican. In recent memory and recent history, Republicans and or Democrats who try to take on or tackle immigration, they usually end up losing their posts or not winning elections. Why are you taking this head on? Well, one, Tom, my district is nearly half of the southern border. Uh, the other part of it, there is not one state in the United States that hasn't become a border state in some form or fashion. And I think we can solve both of these issues. What we see is politically lucrative to blame the other party for everything that's wrong. And, and people run that play over and over. And I, on one end, you have folks that say we can't give in to border security because folks won't have pathway to citizenship. On the other end, you say folks that go, we, we can't give in to pathway to citizenship because we'll We'll never get border security. Well, my bill doesn't attach either of those. Hey, you can still go in your corner and fight over those things. What this bill focuses on is people that want to come over legally to work. It doesn't add, uh, you know, social services or the ability to vote. It removes some of the politics in it, and it focuses on, on work visas. We have shortages in every single industry. I think it's important that we have more of these conversations, real, tangible conversations, uh, to move this country forward. Congressman Gonzalez, you've sometimes butted heads with members of your own party, the Republican Party. You were censured by the Texas Republican Party. Do you think your fellow GOP congressmen and those senators are going to support this bill? You know, Tom, the fact that I already have 10 uh, sponsors on the Republican side and five on the Democratic side is promising. I also say I'm a 20-year military veteran. I fought in two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And most importantly, I have six children, so I do not scare easy. I think it's important that we have these new ideas, if you will. And, and once again, this bill is three pages. It's not intended to solve the immigration crisis. It is intended to move this country, have one step. Imagine if the 118th Congress can do one thing and then all of a sudden, then maybe we can take a second step and a third step. So it tackles it from that approach. Representative Gonzalez, we will track the progress of this bill. We thank you for joining Top Story tonight. All right, we want to turn overseas now to the war in Ukraine, where a major bridge connecting Russia to the Crimean, Crimean Peninsula was damaged today after Ukrainian forces attacked the structure. The strike coming just hours before Russia pulled out of a key grain deal. Keir Simmons with the latest on what this all means for the Kremlin. Tonight, the crucial bridge connecting Russia to the Crimean Peninsula now shut down. Daylight revealing extensive damage. The structure attacked late last night, killing two people and injuring one more, according to Russian officials. Multiple law enforcement sources telling Ukrainian public media that the attack was a special operation by the Ukrainian Navy. The strike embarrassing and infuriating for President Putin who took on the construction of the bridge as a personal project after he annexed Crimea in 2014. This video showing him ceremoniously driving a truck over the bridge. Putin addressing the attack today, saying there will be a response from the Russian side. The defense ministry is preparing adequate proposals. The Kirsch Bridge, a popular civilian route and key supply line for Russian military forces, was also targeted in October 2022 after a truck bomb exploded, requiring months of repair. Today's attack swiftly followed by Russia announcing its suspension of a key grain deal that allowed the export of Ukrainian grain to travel through the Black Sea. Russia says there's no connection between the attack and the deal. It had been threatened for some time, but world leaders fear this latest move could be detrimental to the global food supply. The result of Russia's action today, weaponizing food, using it as a tool, as a weapon in its war against Ukraine, uh, will be to make uh, food harder to come by in places that desperately need it and have prices rise. Today's events coming amid the continuing fallout for Russia since the attempted mutiny by Yevgeny Pogozhin in June. Two top generals, Vladimir Selivostov and Ivan Popov, fired from the ranks in a recent purge of military leaders. And while Pogozhin hasn't been seen since his failed insurrection, his Wagner Group army now reported to be in Belarus.
All right. With that, Keir Simmons joins us now live in studio here on Top Story. Keir, great to see you in person. I, I do want to ask you about that reporting about the Wagner Group in yeah. Belarus. You were just there. Right. So what are the troops doing back there? You leave, they come right. back. What, what's going on? <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, it's one of many very, very good questions. Why are they there? Belarus says they're training Belarus military. But if you believe that, uh, there are fears, of course, that they are there to threaten Ukraine. Where is Yevgeny Pogozhin, the man who led the Wagner Group? That's another important question. Uh, where are some of the generals who are accused of supporting Pogozhin, supporting uh, the Wagner Group? It does look as if, below the surface, and we can't necessarily know what's happening, there is a lot going on, kind of like a, a purge of right. some of these Russian military who may have, been, may have supported uh, that uh, uprising. I guess some of these questions will get answered over time. But how long? Anyone Putin maybe doesn't trust is, is now gone. Right. Um, I do want to go back to the, the grain deal as well. You've reported extensively about this. You went yeah. to Kenya. You brought us some very compelling reporting. Yeah. How quickly will the world feel sort of this new move by Russia to not allow grain to be yeah. exported out of Ukraine? Yeah, fast. Very fast. I mean, in places like Egypt and in East Africa, they really rely on, on these supplies. Now, I should say what Russia says, it claims, and this is Russia talking, obviously, that the grain wasn't reaching those kinds, those kinds of countries. It also says uh, that it wants to export its food as well as Ukraine exporting its grain. Now, what, of course, Secretary of State said today was, well, hold on a minute, Russia, you were the ones that invaded. You are effectively the cause of all this. But as every week goes by, worse maybe, as months go by, it will get more and more difficult for some of the poorest countries in the world. Wow. Okay. Keir Simmons uh, reporting for us right here in studio. Keir, we appreciate that. Yeah. Still ahead tonight, the serial killer clues, police carefully combing through the home of the man accused in a string of murders on New York's Long Island. What they found in the home he shared with his wife and kids, plus a freight train derailment triggering evacuations outside of Philly. What was on board that drew hazmat teams to the scene? A scary moment for country star Jason Aldean, why he was rushed off stage at his concert and how he's doing now. Stay with us, top story just getting started on this Monday night. We're back with the latest on the arrest of an alleged serial killer here in New York. Police on Long Island recovered hundreds of weapons from the suspect's home over the weekend as new details emerge about how police tracked him down. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk is following the story. Today on Long Island, police are not letting up, searching a storage unit possibly connected to the Gilgo Beach murders, just across the bay from where the bodies were found over a decade ago. Investigators are also poring over evidence removed from the suspected serial killer's home over the weekend, including dozens of guns. The house is cluttered, and we are going to go inch by inch through that house. We're going to get everything. 59-year-old Rex Heerman is being held without bail after pleading not guilty to murdering Megan Waterman, Melissa Bartholomew, and Amber Costello, all young women in their 20s who worked for escort services. Police recovered key DNA back in 2010, but all they had was hair. The only DNA you can get is mitochondrial DNA uh, rather than the traditional DNA that you get from traditional DNA testing. And that science today is a lot better than it was Cer over 10 years ago. Certainly in 2010, absolutely. Police also needed a suspect. Witnesses described a large man over six feet tall. One said he drove a Chevrolet Avalanche. It's a collaboration. Between the DA says they identified Heurman and a DNA match was made with some help from this discarded pizza box. We have a lot of pieces that when put together, I think they tell a story, and that certainly is a key piece. Among the allegations in court documents, Melissa Bartholomew's family received multiple taunting phone calls. A male caller admitted killing and sexually assaulting her. Police say Heerman spent time online searching child pornography, sadism, and the Gilgo Beach investigation. But the developments in the case weren't made public. He likely had no idea they were closing in. The DA says there is, quote, substantial evidence linking Kierman to the disappearance of a fourth victim, Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Her body was found very close to the three victims who Kierman is already charged with murdering. Tom? Okay, Stephanie Goss with a lot of new reporting there for us tonight. Stephanie, thanks. When we come back, a major update in the fight against RSV. Have you heard about this? The FDA approving a new drug to protect young children from the dangerous respiratory virus. What parents need to know about the potentially life-saving medication. We will explain next.
right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin tonight with the vigil for the victims of a mass shooting in an Atlanta suburb. Police say the four victims were shot and killed in a residential neighborhood in Hampton, Georgia, on Saturday after a massive manhunt that lasted more than 24 hours. The suspect was killed during a shootout with police. Two officers were hurt but are expected to be okay. Authorities do not believe the suspect knew the victims and are now searching for a motive. An investigation is underway after a freight train derailed just north of Philadelphia. Rail company CSX says 15 cars went off the tracks. and According to authorities, at least one was carrying potentially toxic chemicals. Evacuations were temporarily in place, but hazmat crews were called to the scene and have since given the all clear. No one was hurt. The FDA has approved an injectable to protect children under two from RSV. The antibody shot from AstraZeneca can be given to infants during their first RSV season to prevent serious illness from the lung attacking virus. Children up to age two will be able to receive second doses if they're especially vulnerable. The shot is expected to be available this fall. The CDC says about 80,000 children are hospitalized with RSV each year. And country music star Jason Aldean enduring, I'm sorry, ending a Connecticut concert early after suffering from heat stroke. Social media video appears to show Aldean struggling to sing before running off stage in the middle of a set. You see him right here do it. He did not return, but has since released a video message apologizing to fans, saying it was due to a combination of dehydration and heat exhaustion. Xfinity Theater in Hartford released a statement saying the concert will be rescheduled. Okay, time now for power and politics and the state of the 2024 race for the White House. Governor Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump's number one rival for the Republican presidential nomination, is struggling. His campaign burning through cash and now laying off staffers. This as there's new talk tonight of serious third party challengers. Will this really happen? NBC's Vaughn Hilliard has the latest. Tonight, a shakeup for Ron DeSantis' campaign. The Florida governor fired about a dozen staffers last week with more layoffs possible. It comes as NBC News is first to report new financial records show his team spending millions with little to show for it. We always knew with these national polls that that was a sugar high. And with polls suggesting the prospect of a Biden-Trump rematch seeming more likely, some voters are willing to consider something different. I mean, we need someone in the middle. We need somebody that's going to help unite the world that we're in right now. Democrat Joe Manchin, the West Virginia senator, known for often bucking his party, openly flirting with a White House run as an independent. Are you taking it off the table? We're right. not taking President. anything off the table. Let's see where everybody goes. Let's see what happens. Manchin publicly joining the organization No Labels in New Hampshire today. The group is launching a massive $70 million effort to create a third-party presidential campaign, a bipartisan ticket with a Democrat and a Republican joining forces. Former Utah governor, Republican John Huntsman, also hit the road with the group today. For us to do the same old, same old thing is like a little bit insane. The group will not say who else is under consideration. Nancy Jacobson is the leader of No Labels. This is the one moment that this could be possible. So why not, why not give people a choice if they don't want these two choices? But many, while opposed to a second Trump presidency, fear a third party ticket could siphon votes from Biden and boost Trump. William Galston helped found No Labels 13 years ago, but he left the group in April. Don't think that I wasn't tempted by it, because I was. But in the end, and as a Democrat, I felt I had no choice. But to walk away. All right, Vaughn Hilliard joins us now from Manchester, New Hampshire. Vaughn, I, I want to pick up where you left off there. I, I don't really understand with some of these third-party groups, right? They don't want to be spoilers, but are they putting up candidates or not? If not, then what's the point? Right. I think that that is the question that a lot of folks, not only in the Democratic Party, but the Republican Party are also privately questioning here. What are the intentions of this group? It's not clear. Their donors are private, so we don't know who is really financing this $70 million operation. And no labels. They say that they are not for sure even putting forward a ticket, but instead that they're leaving the door open, especially if in the scenario it were to be a Trump-Biden rematch. And though we should note, though, Tom, we've talked to a great many voters who said they would like a third option. And here in the American democratic system, we've become accustomed to a two-party system over the last 100 years, but it doesn't mean that it has to remain that way. Yeah, we're going to talk about that more in our segment right after we're done with you, Vaughn. Uh, going back to DeSantis at the top of your report there, how big of a shakeup is this in his campaign? Are we talking about major campaign players or is this more of a cost-cutting move? 
This is a cost-cutting move, but one that acknowledges that they are not where they wanted to be, and that perhaps that they hired up and hired too many people too quickly. They burned through a great amount of the money that they raised. They raised a notable sum, but they spent a lot of it. It's kind of reminiscent to Kamala Harris's presidential campaign four years ago. She ended up dropping out of the race before the Iowa caucus even took place. And so for Ron DeSantis, the question is, he was the formidable number two option to Donald Trump. But now other Republicans like Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley, they see the potential opportunity to overtake him as the primary challenger to Donald Trump. Just to be clear, remind me, because you probably know better than me, that comparison, though, the poll numbers for Kamala Harris versus where Ron DeSantis now, were they similar or was she still so very, very far down in the bottom of the pack? No, slowly over as the months went along, she slowly went down in the polls. It wasn't a crash. She started off that race really is a formidable favorite. A lot of people thought that she would be the nominee. But as the months went on, she and her campaign ran out of cash and her polling numbers went right down with it. And that's kind of what we're seeing, though not to the extent so far, but with Ron DeSantis's Republican campaign right now. Von Hilliard, great little story there. We appreciate it as always. And as campaign staff cuts and financial concerns could cause problems for the DeSantis campaign, it may be talks of a third-party candidate that could change the future of the 2024 race. This has long-shot Democratic candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. faces backlash from his own family over controversial comments made about the spread of COVID-19. I want to I want to bring in our politics panel right now. Kevin Sheridan is a former RNC spokesman. Matt Dowd is founder of Country Over Party and an NBC News political contributor. And Democratic strategist Amisha Cross is a friend of Top Story, of course, and she is on this show quite frequently. We thank you all for being here tonight. I want to start with DeSantis. Uh, And, Kevin, I'll start with you. Does this sound like trouble, right, in, in paradise for the DeSantis campaign? Or is this sort of part of the process as you sort of hone your message, hone your team getting into the into the primaries? Yeah, he got off to a tough start, obviously, but um you know, didn't really get the bump from the launch and now has kind of had this stagnant uh, couple of months here. Remember, we're only in July. He can still come back uh, if he gets organized, if he, you know, if, if they set the campaign up way too, with way too much staff, they need to get that in order and they need to figure that out. But uh, he's got to watch his burn rate. Uh, he's got plenty of time to go. He's just got to hone his message and turn it into something that really starts to turn the momentum in his favor because he hasn't had a lot of that for uh, most of this year. Matt, you've been on successful presidential campaigns. What what advice would you give to Governor DeSantis right now? What do you think is happening behind the scenes? Well, first, the the problem isn't 12 staffers or 13 staffers he got rid of. It's the candidate and the candidate's message. That's the fundamental problem because the candidate and the candidate's message right now can't compete in a primary dominated by Donald Trump. This is a... Donald Trump is... 30, nearly 30 points ahead nationally and double digit leads in every single early primary state. And so in order to win this, he has to come up. It's it, He has to streamline this, as Kevin said, not blame somebody else. He has to put the onus on himself. And to me, at this point, being that far behind in a in a party primary dominated by Donald Trump, to me, the only breakout move he can do is in the debate. So if I were him, I'd, be, I'd spend less time worrying about staffing and more time worrying about how he's going to confront Donald Trump at the debates. Amisha, you know, the most we've heard sort of from the from the Biden reelect team is the Bidenomics, right? And they're they're sort of going to be running on this economy message. They've sort of stayed out of the fray when it's come to the Republicans, letting them fight amongst themselves. You think that's going to be the, the, the strategy throughout the Republican primary process? No, I, I think that we're, we're definitely going to see some barbs thrown from the Biden administration, um, some of his surrogates as well. We've seen a little bit of that as it relates to um, him calling out Republicans who have taken credit for infrastructure when they didn't actually support the infrastructure package in and of itself. But I think we're definitely going to see more of that on the campaign trail because he has to draw that contrast. And I say that because both Donald Trump and Joe Biden aren't doing well when it comes to American polling. And we still know that there is quite a bit of time left before the November election, but every moment is going to count. And with the emergence of some of these third party candidates and the idea of a no labels ticket, I think that at the end of the day, uh, Joe Biden has to do a lot of work to turn out the bases that matter to the Democratic Party the most. That is black voters who are now highly upset about the anti DEI strategies that Republicans are running, um, the affirmative action uh, ruling, the most recent ruling overturning that. And watching day in and day out our civil rights be kind of up for grabs and Republicans in very polarizing ways 
snatching a lot of the rights that we worked so hard for and were granted post the civil rights movement. Amisha, do you believe the No Labels Party, I'm not sure what we're going to call it at this point, but the No Labels Group, do you, do you think this is a real threat to Democrats? you think Senator Manchin, do you think former Governor Huntsman, do you think they're really going to run for the presidency? If they actually are able to put up candidates, I do believe that this will be a threat, but not because it will overthrow um, the Democratic or the Republican ticket, but because it stands the opportunity of siphoning votes away from Joe Biden, which is ultimately going to be a leg up for Donald Trump. I think that this race, or whoever the Republican uh, nominee is, I think that this race is going to be extremely close. Um, it, the 2024 race is not going to be a runaway ticket. And in any event, if there is a third party situation that emerges, third party candidates can't win in the United States of America. We've never seen it. It's not it's just not going to happen. However, it does stand a spoiler to actually siphon votes to a candidate that most Americans don't want to see win. Kevin, if, if that is the ticket, Senator Joe Manchin and Huntsman, who does that hurt most if they have any effect at all? Well, we don't know who the, who the Republican nominee is going to be. So I would say at this point, Biden, uh, you know, th these these two guys are not going to pull a lot of Republican votes, I don't think. Uh, Joe Manchin is the great centrist hope, but he uh, he you know is pretty down the line liberal when you really look at his issues. Huntsman never took off in the in the um, Republican primary, so I, I would think it would it would definitely be to the president's detriment. Matt, I have known you for a long time. I, I have heard that you, you you think a third party will eventually emerge, a third party candidate. You had a group yourself. Uh, it was it was Country Over Party, I believe, is the name of it. And Matt, but I do want to ask you, it sounds like every time people talk about a third party, it's usually in between elections. And then when an election comes up, everyone says, no, 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 not now, not now. We, you know, because if this party, if this person runs, it's going to hurt the Democrats. If that person runs, it's going to hurt the Republicans. It's happened in times before. Where do you stand right now? Well, I actually think the United States would benefit from a multi-party system. It's to give more people and more interest a stake in the game. The problem is the st current structure of our democracy forces things into a two-party two choice, that this, the structure, the Senate race is how it's structured, and two is the times we're in, because right now there is a real definitive choice between the Democrats, who, though liberal or progressive on certain issues, are the only pro-democracy party that exists in America today, versus the Republicans. And I think that's the par problem I have with no labels. And I think they know in their heart they can't win this race. So I don't actually actually know what the point there is they're doing. I think their effort could, hit, could, could put a detriment on anybody that wants multi-parties in this country, because at best, they're probably going to get 10 or 12 percent of the vote, and it's going to hurt one or the other two candidates, probably Biden. But at this moment in time, there's not room for a third party. Kevin, you want to weigh in on that? I, you, I had some choice words there. Well, for the current Republican Party? Yeah. Um, well, look, the, We've got a we've got a field that's going to sort itself out here in the next few months, and hopefully winnows down a little bit. So some of these guys might actually start to drop out; they'll run out of money, um, and we'll get a more defined discussion about what's going on. As far as a third party goes, I don't see any realistic chance of them ever doing anything other than probably just hurting the current incumbent. Uh, so I don't see what the point is. They're they're <laughs> they're angering a lot of Democrats though in D.C. D.C. Democrats are not happy about the, the no levels. Amisha, I do want to turn now to, to the Democrats and, and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. making comments in a video reported by The New York Post. I want to take a look at that. Let's roll that clip. COVID-19 is targeted to attack uh, Caucasians and, uh, and, uh, and uh, black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and, uh, and Chinese. So Kennedy has since pushed back on this reporting, and his family has come out and denounced him, many of his family members. How, how is Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s candidacy impacting the Democrats, you think, in 2024? I don't think it's impacting Democrats at all. The people who are carrying the water for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. are honestly right-wingers and uh, white-ring-adjacent people and those who have social media platforms who, again, are not Democratic voters and don't represent Democrats. His problem coming out of the gate with the conspiracy theory, the anti-Semitism, and some of the stances that he's taken is that they never caught fire with actual Democratic voters. The base was never with RFK Jr. I think part of that is because throughout history he's had some significant issues. But beyond that, the people who have literally been retweeting, sharing his stuff, having him on their shows, and having regular conversation and engaging in the really radical conspiracy, conspiratorial things are largely folks who don't engage and vote Democrat anyway. So his biggest 
voting base, it seems like, are individuals who are going to be right wing. So I, I don't think that he was a, a game starter or stopper for Democrats. To be honest, he was just somebody who happened to appeal to the appetite of many people who just happened to be leaning more on conspiracy on the right. Okay, Amisha, we appreciate your time. Kevin, the same with you. Matt Dowd, love that new mustache, man. We will see each other <laughs> soon. Coming up next, the landslide disaster. Video showing the moment a hillside came tumbling down in South Korea, trapping dozens inside a tunnel. What triggered that deadly collapse? Stay with us. All right, back now with Top Stories Global Watch and the deadly flooding in South Korea. New video shows the moment a mountain landslide buried a tunnel about 82 miles from Seoul. Days of torrential downpours in the country's central and southern regions has triggered landslides and flooding. At least 40 people have been killed, with many still missing. More than 10,000 people have been evacuated from that area. The FBI says a California woman who was kidnapped in Mexico has been released by her captors. Federal authorities say Monica de Leon Barba was last seen on this surveillance video walking with her dog in the state of Jalisco eight months ago. An obstructed view reportedly capturing the moment she was forced into a gray Jetta. De Leon Barba has now been released and reunited with her family in the Bay Area. The FBI is still trying to identify the suspects. And in Iran, morality police resuming patrol 10 months after nationwide protest. Authorities return to the streets to ensure women are properly covering their hair. The police now removing the morality police labels from their vehicles and using patrolmen with body cams. This comes after a period of scaled back enforcement that followed the death of Masa Amini, who died in police custody, you may remember, after not properly wearing her hijab. All right, coming up, the historic first, the nation's largest police force and its new boss, his inspiring story. That's next. And finally tonight, the hometown police officer making history right here in New York City. Mayor Eric Adams naming Edward Caban as the next NYPD commissioner. He's the first Hispanic to lead the nation's largest police department, and he has deep family connections to New York City and policing. At the NYPD's 40th precinct, they're cheering his name. With his hand on the Bible, Commissioner Edward Eddie Caban sworn in and making history as the first Hispanic to lead the country's largest police department in its nearly 200-year-old history. This is an amazing moment for not only the Spanish-speaking community, this is an amazing moment for our entire city and country of what we are doing. Today is a full circle moment for the Puerto Rican and father of two who rose up the ranks of the NYPD over three decades. To be the first Hispanic police commissioner is an honor of the highest measure. Caban sworn in at a time when the department battles the public's post-pandemic concerns about crime. A new Siena College poll revealing 61% of New Yorkers worry they could be a victim of a crime. A fear that the New York native has heard before, even when he joined the force in 1991. In those days, the top bosses of the police department didn't really look like me. Police officer Eddie Caban could not walk into the 4-0 precinct, look up at the leadership photos hanging on the wall, and envision his future. Fortunately for me, I had a mentor who pushed me. That mentor, a longtime New York City transit police detective who advocated for many facing barriers in their careers. He always told me, it's not what you have on your tool belt. It's how you talk to people. This tool, your mouth, is your best tool that you'll ever have out in the street. But for a young Caban, those words of encouragement were personal. Many called him Detective Caban, but I was blessed to call him Dad. Caban's father, Juan, today standing by his side, tearing up to see his son now leading the department. I'm blessed that my dad is still with us and can see the impact of his guidance come full circle. Edward Caban's new top job filling the position left by Kishant Sewell's abrupt departure in June. She was the first woman to serve as police commissioner. The mayor adding that in her 18-month tenure, the city saw a drop in shootings and homicides. But a federal monitor warned last month about the department's reliance on aggressive stop-and-frisk style tactics, targeting specifically communities of color. Stop and frisk outlawed in 2013, but reportedly still happening. The Monitor reports 97% of those stopped were black or Hispanic. When you look at the department, you don't see youthfulness. You don't see the diversity at the top. 
Adam's pick indicative of a larger demographic change within the department. More than 30% of all uniformed NYPD officers are Hispanic. Finally, we got somebody representing the Latino people and all people, and um, change is good. Also joining Caban, another historic pick, Tania Kinsella, the first woman of color to serve as deputy police commissioner. I am the daughter of two immigrants. This is the American dream. The NYPD now under new leadership in a city desperate for a fresh start. Thank you. All right, that does it for us tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.